folks just a little bit longer. Um, so I'll start off by just welcoming everybody to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, AKA the year 2020 True Refuge Collective. Um, and just really delighted to be here in community uh, in the Dharma in practice with you all um, as, as, I, as I feel every week. Um, I'm Eve Ekman and I co-teach this evening with the incomparable Chandra Easton. Um, and we often take turns either teaching one night or the other. Um, we'll be back together next week. Um, and we've been going through this classic set of slogans. And, and I like that word slogan. Um, they really are these kind of almost propaganda-like uh, sentences that help us really identify and feel the resonance that words, words can be transformation, right? Not only, you know, their individual meaning, but when we string them together, what is provoked? Um, I've been very moved by some of the benefits of, um, some of you may practice with mantra or chanting, and you realize even just certain tones of word have a great amount of weight um, and transformative capacity. But the slogans, their intention is to provoke us and to provoke us to as much as possible, release grasping and turn towards compassion. And we need to learn that so many times. We forget every day, all the time, what great freedom that creates for us. So these slogans in some ways are, you know, many different cuts of the diamond, many different ways to approach that same really simple wisdom, that transformative alchemical wisdom with different words, with different ideas, different ways we become completely absorbed within our own experience of ourself and that we lose compassion, so essential for this transformation. So before we go ahead and get started, we have um, our announcements that happen at the beginning of our evening by our wonderful board and volunteers of the San Francisco Dharma Collective. So I will leave it to you all. Hi folks, I'm Pamela and this is Mace. We help volunteer on Wednesday night. Um, so great. I think I just wanna make sure that you guys know that there is there are lots of things happening at the Dharma Collective outside of Wednesday night. Um, and that includes the morning sit. I don't know, I think it's like 45 minutes. Yep. And it's this thing where people pop up on Zoom, used to be in person, but you know how that goes. They pop up on Zoom and then there's a person who's a volunteer who rings a bell and then you sit for like, I think it's 45 minutes, maybe it's just a half hour, unless of course okay. that's not working for you. And then you just, you get to opt on to the rest of your day whenever you want. And then they'll ring a bell when the 45 minutes is up to close. So that's kind of nice because, I mean, I think, because sometimes it's nice to just sit in silence without any instruction um, and also to sort of stretch out in the container of meditation a little bit. So just to add that for folks, um might find that interesting in the morning at 7 30. I'm very excited about it but I haven't a clue what time it is so maybe I'm not the best announcer. There's a link. There's a link. <laughs> um Katie put a link in the chat. Thank you Katie. It'll show you more about that event. Um, and then all of our contributions of our time and our energy and our dollar bills go into the center to help support those kinds of sits, um, as well as what we're doing here on Wednesday night with Eve and Lopan Chandra, the well being, and all of the other activities that happen throughout the week. Those you can find out about on the SFDC website. There's a little events area and it lists all of the events. So, you know, if you want to have all kinds of adventures throughout the week at the Dharma Collective. Check that out and thank you so much for all the contributions that come in on Wednesday night. It makes a big difference um, and it has really been a big sustainer of the community throughout this time. So give what you can and thank you so much. And Wednesday night crew, just a, a tiny little extra ask. Um, it's beautiful, all the contributions that come in on Wednesday night. If you could specify um, which teacher was teaching, it helps the finance crew 
um, it's not urgent, but if you're just one of the regular people that donates, it's really helpful. And then we can organize it more distribute quickly. the funds yeah. more quickly. That's all. But it's beautiful that people are donating and we're really thankful. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's something Chandra and I speak about um, the generosity of teaching and um, how beautiful it is to have this center where everybody is welcome, irrespective of ability to pay and that your generosity creates a field of generosity. Um, I, I know myself, um, it allows me to donate to the causes that um, I most care about in terms of moving towards racial justice. So your donations go there. Um, and that's my desire and, and heartfelt aspiration is to support that work. So there's like a generosity that we can experience cyclically as it moves forward. So thank you so much for that. And I just want to welcome everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective once again. This is our Wednesday night well of being. We'll be proceeding with our close attending to the practices of the Lojong and something that Chandra and I have set up and feel passionate about, not only for Lojong, but I think for just this time that we are living in is we will do two practices tonight. We will start off with the practice of settling the mind and creating space. It's an essential way for us to develop that meta awareness to know our own mind, to have some close intimacy with what is going on as our thoughts, feelings, and sensations are traveling through and develop that quality of easeful and vivid attention. We will then talk about the slogan and then apply a practice of compassion to ourselves. So as much as that wonderful capacity for sustaining attention and openness is essential, we also need this other wing of the bird, this ability to have compassion for ourselves. Tonight, the flavor of our compassion for ourselves will include a lot of self-forgiveness. So if you've been, you know, harboring some stuff that you're having a hard time <laughs> forgiving yourself for, this is your night. Um, it's always a good night for me for that practice. I just, no matter how vigilant I think I can be, I see all the ways I'm, I'm often blaming myself. Um, I'm getting I'm getting a sense that um, I'm doing it wrong. I'm, I'm not doing it in the way that would most be beneficial for me and for others. And even when that's true, that tone of how we meet ourselves can be so softened by these practices of forgiveness and compassion. As we are coming together for this evening, some of you may become often, I know some of your faces, some of you maybe it's your first time. All of you are an equal part of this Dharma collective and all of us together co create experience of a loving inner. So my request, my aspiration for us is that we come together with mutual respect and recognizing that we just have no idea uh, where all of us are coming from today. What are the joys? What are the horrors? What is the despair? What is the peace that we're all coming in here with? And that's true for our lifetime. And so to really have a sense that you know, we can be together with one another as much as possible without judgment, without some idea that we actually know what another person is going through. So when we do share through the chat or speaking up that we really hold one another with a sense of generosity and that we hold ourselves to a sense of inner discipline as much as possible adhering to a sense of non-harming at the most intensive degree you could imagine. How non-harming can you be? How gentle can you be? Myself in my ongoing explorations for inner non-harming, I've been really working with this idea of uh, simplicity, simplicity in all the ways that I'm approaching and that that creates a lot of non-harming, paying close attention and simplicity. So if that's something that resonates for you tonight, wonderful. But again, just keeping in mind as we are together this evening to have as much empathy and respect for one another as we can possibly um, manage. And you know, if we inadvertently create a situation where folks feel um, offended, uncomfortable, I really deeply um, request of you, hard though it may be, to reach out to one of us and let us know. Uh, we really wanna create a space where people feel safe and included. And if we miss on that, um, it'd be really helpful. Sometimes it can be hard to reach out to the person who is um, teaching for the night. So you can reach out to any of the facilitators um, or find a way to let us know. I would so deeply appreciate that. I have learned so much um, from all the ways I wasn't seeing um, as a teacher over these years. 
So with all that preamble, I'm gonna invite us to make our way to a comfortable inner and outer posture for practice. We're gonna start this evening practice by reflecting on these preliminaries, these preliminaries which are part of the Lojong um, and in and of themselves can be something that people reflect on daily. I have had uh, friends and other practitioners who've chosen even just one of these preliminaries to work on for an entire month, just meditating it on, meditating upon it during the day. And it helps us with this idea of how do we use words in a transformative capacity. So let's go ahead and get ourselves into a posture that really supports the dignity of our practice. That invites us to feel just the simple and basic support of this earth that still remains below us. So as much as we can feel almost a letting down or a letting go of tension, we can feel a rising up of support tangibly from the floor beneath us, but also from within the spine, the uprightness of our central channel. And find a softness in the eyes and around the jaw and the lips. Feel or imagine as though the chest had an invisible string that was pulling it upwards towards the heavens. Find a softness an openness in the belly inviting the breath to fully fill the space of the belly. And feeling this spine as though it were a column of stacked golden coins, upright. And so leading us into practice, we reflect on the first of these preliminaries. So letting the words just gently land in the mind and the body, and then notice the reverberation of these words without thinking or analyzing. Notice the impact of hearing these words, experiencing the knowingness of what they mean. The first is maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. And now shifting to the second, refreshing your embodied awareness and readiness. Be aware of the reality that life ends. Death and impermanence comes for everyone. Moving to the third, recall that whatever you do, whether virtuous or not, has a result. Thank you. 
And the last one, contemplate that as long as you are too focused on self-importance and too caught up in thinking about how you are good or how you are bad, you will suffer. And with hopefully the motivation that comes from reflecting on these basic preliminaries, we move now into our practice, settling the body into its natural state, inviting qualities of relaxation, stillness, and dignity. Allow your awareness of the breath to be throughout the body, experiencing the whole body breathing from within the body itself. When the mind gets caught up in distraction, dullness, simply relax, release, and refresh your interest for a bit longer on settling the body into this natural state. And then inviting the inner narration, our inner speech, also to settle. If it's not possible to completely turn it off, imagine that you could lower the volume a bit. One way we can approach this is through focusing on the natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the breath as you inhale, noticing the breath as you exhale. So narrowing the focus of our attention a bit, not just the entire body breathing, but the breath itself. And the next, traveling to attempting as much as possible to settle our mind, to release grasping, release distraction, sustain an awareness in this present moment, breath by breath by breath. To do so, we can narrow the focus a bit more, but not tightening 
not making our attention feel constricted. Instead, consider brightening your attention, noticing the subtle sensations of breath as they travel in and out of the nostrils. If the mind is so busy, just full of distracting thoughts, grasping to the future, traveling to the past, see if you can engage with a full body relaxation, not changing or shifting anything, not slumping your posture, but imagining as though the body and mind from the inside out could just release If on the other hand, your experience is just feeling tired and worn out, depleted, invite the entire body and mind to refresh. Tuning in to the deeper wells of our inner vitality, irrespective of physical exhaustion or mental fatigue. Feel that unperturbed well of deep vividness. And continue for a bit longer with this close attending to the moment to moment sensations of breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. With this very narrow and small aperture, focusing just on these sensations of breath, we invite ourselves to shift, to widen that aperture, including more and more spaciousness. Instead of directing a single beam of attention to sensation at the nostrils, Feel as though your attention was mingling with the entire space of the mind. We now focus our practice on settling the mind into its natural state and noticing the thoughts and memories and images that arise within the space. But our, our focus, our point of view is from watching, noticing as though we were leaning back in our mind, resting in the awareness. In this practice, we don't need to push thoughts away. We don't need to deny them but we don't engage, we don't energize. 
We rest in the mind, in the space of mind from which thoughts, memories, and images arise. For some of us, this practice will immediately make us feel spaced out. In this case, you can practice by bringing a specific image to mind. You could, for example, imagine a redwood tree. And just as that image <clears throat> arises, notice where it arose from. And then releasing the image, <clears throat> noticing where it dissipates back from and resting your mind in that space of arising and dissipating. You may catch a glimpse of the spaciousness of mind between thoughts. Notice and really feel into what is the quality of that spaciousness? Is it light? Is it dark? Is it luminous? Is it confined or is it without confinement? Really feel into the first person experiencing of the space of your own mind as though it were the very first time. Keep leaning back in the mind for just a bit longer. And for the last moments of this practice, gently allow the eyes to be partially open. Increasing the vividness. Softly focused.
And feel or imagine as though what you could see represents only a small part of your entire awareness. The awareness is not just in front of you, but above you, below you, and behind you. Gently allowing the eyes to close once again. And bringing the awareness fully back into the body. Notice and welcome whatever is here greeting you as you bring your awareness back into the body. Thank you for your practice. Are there any questions on that practice? Chandra and I have been teaching, you know, a bit of that <laughs> over and over, and we plan to continue to do so. I think it's a, um, a practice we can continue to learn from. Any questions or comments on that practice? You can raise your hand, you can type in the chat, whatever works for you. I don't know about other people, but the smoke um, is really getting to me again today. Very, uh, very humbling. I felt safe and found refuge. Oh, I'm so happy, Jason. How wonderful, wonderful sense of space. Great. Anybody else? It's a simple practice. I'll say one or two more things about it. Um, it's a great practice to, that can prepare us to move into more non-dual practices. So we're really presenting ourselves with the opportunity to create the awareness of being aware, <laughs> right? So right now we're, we're creating the awareness of what are these thoughts? Where are they? Where are they coming and going? What are they like? What are the qualities of them? And we're kind of like starting just little bit, little bit. What is it like in between those thoughts? What is the space of awareness? In these non-dual practices, some of you are very familiar and 
some of you maybe not so much, um, they really provide us this unbelievably unique opportunity to let go of our egoic identity project. Because we are no longer kind of identifying and naming and evaluating what's happening to us. We are just what is happening to us. It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to get there. It's a difficult practice. And yet those experiences that people um, cultivate of having that non-dual consciousness really supports their feeling of interconnection and interdependence, mostly because it just kind of, you know, softens and dissolves, starts to kind of uh, perforate this idea of some sort of you <laughs> as separate from some sort of other. And so the practice is not only do they kind of, you know, at a, at, a, at a sensorial level, they get you kind of high. You feel like this, wow, like, wow, really space and an um, often kind of luminous nature. But the real benefit is that feeling of not being separate, not being different, not being um, anything other than in the flow with reality as it is, which is... Um, yeah, quite refreshing. Yeah. Hi, Marianne. Um, thank you for the sit. Yeah, after watching the VP debate, it was nice to let go and come to a safe place for grounding and calmness. Yeah, it's really, you know, I think, especially, you know, for those of us, you know, cultivating our practice, cultivating our hearts and minds, when exposed to the intensity of something like those debates, it can be a just like, just energetically, um, it can feel quite heavy um, and quite intense. And coming home to our practice is so, yeah, so wonderful. Yeah. Any other, I don't know if you guys also have this too, but sometimes I, I was, had the good fortune to be on retreat this weekend. Um, so I got to kind of, uh, you know, as they say, part the veils a bit between uh, the divine and uh, what is eternal, what is our kind of universal um, beingness, and then the everyday conventional reality. And in sometimes what happens in those re retreat experiences, for me at least, and I've heard for others, is you see the way that we live our life a little bit like a show, like this big act. Um, and it's kind of funny, almost, like you can laugh in a little bit. And I watched the first part of the debates with my dad, and I kept having the sense of, this isn't real, is it? No, this isn't really happening. This seems not real, um, which uh, I think could lend itself to some dangerous at places at point. But for me, it was nice to have a little bit of that levity uh, in that experience. Yes, thankful to have the well-being after the debate. Agreed. And as I, I mentioned, I, I actually think that this slogan, which I'll put in the chat now, um, is truly <laughs> the antithesis of the debate. It's the opposite. It's not the remedy or antidote. Um, I do wish that um, Mike and Kamala were joining us this evening. I, I, I think that they would find this useful and enriching and a different approach. Um, and for those of you maybe just joining or who haven't come, these Lojong slogans, uh, which have been passed down for um, many, many, many generations are pith instructions, not by the Buddha himself, but pith instructions in how to transform our mind. And each one of these slogans, we spend a night kind of working with and applying, how is this relevant to my life? Um, and so I'm curious for you all, <laughs> drive all blames into one. What does that, what do you think of? What does that mean to you? Um, this was one of the three slogans that I taught at the former Against the Stream after the election. It is one I think it can be just unbelievably um, interesting to look at, but uh, especially in, <laughs> in related to high intensity political experiences. Drive all blames into one. Any thoughts, any, any guesses? What does that mean when you hear that?
One of my teachers this weekend commented that we are all Trump, as hard as that is to hear. Mm. Um, and Eli says, negatively, it's all samsara. <laughs> Positively, it's all deserving of love. Hmm. Thank you, Eli. Yeah. So driving all blames into one. And indeed, with, with what Noam's teacher or teaching this weekend was pointing to is um, where can we find ourself within that which we would so like to blame for everything happening? Right, where can we find our own experience? So this slogan, um, and Diane says, I'm creating the blame even though they seem innumerable and different and from out there. Yeah, yeah, right? You know, the blame itself. So when we think of this slogan, um, it actually kind of helps us look at um, getting like how and where we get caught in blame, where we're kind of, you know, um, I would say almost um, kind of discharging that energy of blame onto others. And according to the Lojong, um, the blame really starts with us, with one. And it starts not because we're, we're at the fault. No, it's not them, it's all you. No, not that, we don't wanna get into self-blaming. It's that our self-centeredness, this misapprehension of reality, that the world kind of exists as a play or a stage in which we are the main actor. That is where so much of our difficulty and our suffering comes from. It doesn't mean that there isn't wrong or bad in the world, but it really is an invitation for us to examine blame at a deep level. So when we think of what in Buddhism are called mental afflictions, anger, craving, ignorance, jealousy, and pride, we see these my God, I mean, they are inextricably related to our self-centeredness, right? Especially when they are mental afflictions. Um, as many of you know, I um, am deeply involved in the study of and practice and examination of emotions. Our emotions are temporary. They come and go. We can have anger and jealousy. We can have even aversion um, as a coming and going. But when we think of them as affliction, they're actually a habit, a way of thinking, a way of responding to the world. They always do that. They're the ones who are always wrong. Like that mode of thinking, that mode of responding. So we're not saying that we should never have an experience of anger or jealousy or pride, but that there's habits, those habits of feeling that way which is so interesting, you know, we, we almost, we're so close to our habits, we think that they are us. Well, that's just the kind of person I am. You like it or you don't like it, right? Or that's how I was raised. But in fact, they are these systems of thinking that we have perpetuated and given momentum to over time, but they aren't who we are. They are not, right? And we can examine them closely. We can pull them apart in the spaciousness of our mind. And then we can love them so deeply with our compassion, right? That is, that is the move. But I really like this idea of, <laughs> I mean, wow, getting after blame. It's not something, you know, it's, it's, so it's not an emotion. So I don't think about it uh, in the same level or depth. I think about other emotions, but blame definitely has the energy of anger. And I think a lot of our blame is coming out of a place of anger or a place of contempt. We know better. We, we are, you know, more knowledgeable. So that other person is wrong or bad. Um, so Shanti Deva, um, whose book we uh, read together, was it only last year? I think last year. In the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, he writes, if all the harm, fear, and suffering in the world occurs due to grasping onto the self, what use is that demon to me? <laughs> so that demon is not like, I am a demon. It's that grasping onto some idea of me that has this demon-like energy. Um, and Diane writes here, I love thinking of the poison of ignorance as being confusion. 
Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Diane, for that framing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> you know, I think this idea of driving all blames into one, it sounds good. <laughs> it makes logical and rational sense to see that, of course, right, some of the things that we are most attributing to others as being wrong or bad, either we're caught up in our own self-absorption and as a result, we're seeing ourselves as totally separate from that experience. Um, you know, and when we think of like the simple blaming we do in our everyday life, so not even like the big ones against our political structures or um, systemic inequality, like what about the blame that we just have for the person we live with? The small ways that we blame one another. And we feel that kind of like energy rising. And again, it has that kind of, it has that feeling of, um, of anger. And with anger, there's urgency. So we feel this blame, like, I can't believe you did that. Like you always do that, or you never do that. And there's that sense of being right. And that sense of being right, again, it's predicated on the fact that we know better because we have positioned the world in relationship to us as, as opposed to positioning the world in relationship to everybody involved. Like a obviously very different set of circumstances. I also want to bring up that when we think about driving all blame into one, especially right now, oh, here's a good time for me to plug myself and venerable Tenzin Choki, the most amazing, um, one of the most amazing human beings on the planet. We are teaching a, um, a three hour session on shame, woohoo, on Saturday <laughs> afternoon. And uh, you should definitely join us. Um, and when we were kind of planning the session, we were talking about the unbelievable um, amount of shame going on in social media right now around the pandemic. And there's been some recent coverage and news articles around um, people who are blamed to be super spreaders. And sometimes that's true. And they did so, you know, in a hazardous way. Many times it's not true. Either they didn't know or they didn't spread, but that culture of shaming is experienced at such an intense level. I mean, imagine having literally hundreds of thousands of texts and messages coming through your Facebook, people calling your home, right? Shaming you. Um, it's, it was in one article I read in the New Yorker, it was compared to you know these puritanical approach to putting people in the stocks, right? So you did something wrong and you get put in the middle of the town square and you're kind of bound in this wooden plank. Um, so this culture of blaming and shaming, it actually doesn't lend itself any opportunity for repair and forgiveness, which are so deeply needed. We live in such a large society and culture that we can feel as though people in some ways are kind of, um, you know, um, what's the word, disposable. But if we lived in our society that mirrored more of our environment of evolutionary adaptedness, we couldn't actually cancel people, right? We couldn't exclude them. Every person was needed for our survival. So there was methods in order to have people be able to um, kind of be held to standards of, um, restorative justice and coming back into the fold of their own communities with healing, with forgiveness. So I just think about the destructive power of blame now in this enormous arena of this connected world that we're living in. Um, and I'd be, yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear from you folks what that brings up when we think about this specific era and epoch we are living in and the way in which blame and shame is just at a, what feels to be like, I mean, I don't know, I am not a historian. I haven't lived in other eras, but wow, it seems like a really hard time for us to be existing with one another and avoiding um, blame and shame at that public. I mean, not saying that each of us is experiencing that, but it's such a, it's such a public hazard, right? 
Um, I look even <laughs> at a small level, but I don't know if any of you are on Nextdoor. You guys on Nextdoor? You know that? It's a platform where neighbors get together to communicate. My God, I think it's like a full blame platform. It's like a shame show, you know? I mean, it's, oh, I look at it. It's like slightly entertaining, which is also a problem, um, but it is vicious, you know? You post something you think is so harmless, like, I love my cat. And people are just like tearing you down. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's a really, it's a really hard time um, in our culture and our society to understand how do we be together online? And in this pandemic, most of us are living our social lives online. Um, so um, yes, thank you, Diane, for sharing the link. And Jason says, blame and shame leave no, leaves no room for grief. Oh, that's really interesting. Grief of the person who's being blamed or grief of the people blaming? Maybe both. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's easier to blame someone else than to feel our grief. Right. So we think about, for example, um, you know, the death penalty. And if you looked at it from a kind of very outside point of view, you're like, wait, one person was killed and that created so much pain. So let's have someone else be killed. And you're like, that doesn't make sense. Um, but in the context and the lens that you're providing us, Jason, of like, the blame can actually help us in some ways manage the grief. And grief is for sadness specifically is an emotion in which we feel disempowered. And most of us would rather feel almost anything other than disempowered. So we go to rage or we go to shaming. Um, yeah. Isn't blame sometimes rooted in fear? Heck yes, absolutely. Yeah, so it can be rooted in sadness. And you're rooted in fear, right? And again, I said that some of the emotions that can lead to blame are contempt, but also fear, right? So again, in this very, ugh, God, it's just such a confusing time. I don't know if any of you like know people who are traveling on planes, right? How do we feel about traveling on planes um, for pleasure or for fun? Um, you know, it's, like it can be easy to say like those people, like they're wrong, but none of us know, we're all afraid. <laughs> we don't know what's right. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of reasons and circumstances why that travel might be worthwhile. Um, how about grief for the aspects of our lives that are limited and lost now? Yeah. And again, um, I did watch a little bit of the debates and it really just felt as though each candidate was just blaming the other, right? You didn't do enough, you don't care enough, you didn't, and um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't really making a lot of space for grief. It wasn't really making a lot of space for, wow, what a terrible place we are in, in this country, in this world right now. Um, shame is totally toxic for me and creates delusion and suffering which I manage with blame. There you go. That's that unbelievable cycle there. So another um, friend and Dharma teacher, Dave Smith often says, you know, like the contempt and shame spiral, where if someone feels contempt for you, if they're like, I'm better than you, you experience shame. And then you want to have contempt for them. And you know, it's like that really, like there's this way in which it gets really tough. It gets really tough. And, you know, as with all of these teachings, how do we apply them to ourselves first? How can we exercise them to ourselves first? So then it's really weird because we're turning all blames into one, but we're also looking at how blaming ourselves is self-centered. <laughs> Not funny. Blaming ourselves is self-centered. 
And it's, um, you know, it's, it's this, it's funny because we often think of self-centeredness as the arrogant and aggrandizing, but self-centeredness is also feeling as though we are worthless and no good. You're still at the center, right? You're still at the center. And so it's interesting, you know, because I think it's, um, I think it's very unlikely for a lot of us who, who suffer from crippling self-criticism um, as someone I'd say in recovery from that um, at, with many relapses, I don't feel like I'm self-centered. I feel like I'm self-diminishing, but the impact is the same. Again, my focus is so much on me that I'm unavailable to others. Um, and the focus is on me and that is the root of the suffering, right? Um, so it's a very interesting idea of like, how do we start to forgive ourselves? Um, so the next practice that we're going to do together, um, and we'll have a little bit of time after to, to, to chat is, uh, is a practice in which we give ourselves forgiveness, give ourselves forgiveness for the times in which we may have contributed to inadvertently harming ourselves or others through self-absorption. So sometimes in these practices, people get a little overwhelmed thinking of examples. So I'm gonna give you this moment <laughs> here to think of a time in the past when through maybe your own self-absorption, you really accidentally, right? Not purposely, you harmed someone, someone you care about, maybe someone you don't know well, you're so caught up in your own story about you, what was going on for you, that you accidentally harm someone. Can everybody think of an example? If you can't, I have some despair you can work on for me. <laughs> You know, I, I think of, you know, I think of myself also one example without giving too much detail was um, a time when I was, was really stressed out um, and really lost in my stress. Uh, I was transitioning jobs and I just felt overwhelmed. Um, and, you know, I, um, I don't think I made space for a friend who was also suffering. I didn't realize it. I didn't realize what she was going through because I was so caught up in my stuff. And her being an amazing caretaker, listened to me, held it for me. Um, but I really, you know, I think it, I think it harmed her, you know, and felt like I wasn't there for her. And so I, I am, I am thinking about that still years ago, but still. Um, so that's an example. So everybody have an example now? Something come to mind? Okay. Doesn't have to be the biggest thing. It can be something small but something that really, you know, you're like, oh yeah, don't love that version of myself, right? Or I don't love that way of being that I was in. Okay, so let's find ourselves back into our meditation posture, that, that inner and outer dignity, as though we were kind of gathering back in all this attention. I'm really feeling the incredible generosity of that. Oh, I'm, I'm gifting all of my attention to me to care for this body, this mind, this heart. Let's begin this practice of compassion and Tonglen by applying a Tonglen to just this present moment. Noticing what is here in this current environment that may feel a little difficult 
This could be the presence of fatigue. This could be the presence of an ache or pain, physical or mental. Really giving yourself a sense of care and kindness by turning towards whatever is here in this environment of practice in this moment that wants your loving and caring presence. Providing that loving presence to your itchy eyes from the smoke. to your heavy heart from the state of the world. To your healing injury or your chronic pain. Right now in this moment, give yourself love and care. Feeling that traveling in through each breath, traveling out through each breath. loving fully whatever is here. And you could think of this as just cleaning your own hearths, rubbing the dust off the gold of your heart. And having engaged this compassionate capacity to extend love to ourselves, we'll now bring to mind and visualize some time in the past, which we can remember clearly, being caught up in our own experience, suffering from that self-absorption and inadvertently harming someone as a result. It wasn't our intention, it wasn't our hope. And yet, a way in which we maybe look back and feel regret. So bring to mind vividly, but simply, what was happening in this experience? Who else was involved if it was more than just one person? Remembering your own suffering in that time, being so absorbed, <clears throat> contributing to your own mental suffering. And right here in this moment, retrospectively, sending compassion to that time to those thoughts and those feelings, to that experience of being caught up in our own delusions and projections, our own confusion. Notice if you slip into blaming of yourself and delicately and gently pull out from that. And instead wrap these arms of compassion around that past self. Providing the soothing and care that wasn't available at the time. As you imagine and embrace this past self, maybe some words arise internally. 
I love you, I forgive you, it's okay. And just focusing the breath on drawing in from this inner deep well of compassion and extending through the exhale back in time. from this place of understanding and love, from forgiveness and compassion for ourselves, we extend that compassionate care to the person that we inadvertently harm. Now seeing clearly and understanding their pain, their hurt, drawing in from our inhale to this deep well of compassion and exhale, extending out to this person in the past, the love and presence we did not have available. couple more breaths here. And then returning for a couple breaths, just feeling in the body an experience of compassion, feeling this very body as a body of compassion. a body of love, a body of presence. Now taking a moment to come into the present moment of our life, <clears throat> our current lived experience. there's some aspect of our life as we're living it now in which we are blaming ourselves. In which we are caught in that self-absorption of thinking we are wrong and bad. Just see what arises. It doesn't have to be a very clear or specific, but if there's some recent example or some repetitive way of responding, turn towards that soberly and clearly see that pattern. And once again, in this moment, sending your heart's arms around you, embracing that pain, that shame, that self-blame with unconditional loving kindness, compassion, and care. in this moment, again, considering what words may arise. I love you. I forgive you. Allowing the breath to really dredge up these feelings of blame 
And extending this sense of care and compassion and kindness to ourself right here. now from this place of caring deeply for ourself in this moment. Consider, is there a person, maybe someone you know, or maybe someone on the world stage for whom you hold a great deal of blame right now? Whoever comes to mind is perfectly fine. If you don't feel like there's anyone you have a lot of blame for, then choose someone who you occasionally blame. Bringing this person to mind, maybe that arises this sense of indignation, righteousness. Maybe it brings forth fear or grief taking just a couple moments here to notice what it's like to bring this person to mind and the blame that arises and thinking about how they move through the world, what they do. And then radically, heroically, considering, is it possible to forgive this person? Not their actions, but this person. Notice even in the body and mind what it is like to entertain this idea. And just be with that. without overanalyzing or letting the mind get too involved. Just practice. It's okay if it doesn't feel that it lands, it doesn't feel strong, but just practice withdrawing in from your deepest well of compassion and extending this open heart of compassion, this open heart of forgiveness to this person. Notice resistance or aversion, but also notice the possibility of freedom. Freedom from the contraction, constriction, from the effort. If it still feels hard, you can imagine this person as a baby. Fresh, innocent, new to the world. Just a couple more moments here. Exercising this Forgiveness muscle. Gently releasing this person from your mind. 
And just coming back to breathe in and breathe out. The feeling of being this body of compassion. Thank you for your brave practice. Yeah, if anyone would like to share either in chat or raising your hand, be curious what that practice brought up, what, what insights you had or what struggles you had. Thank you for this. It was so timely. I was in an accident last week, um, riding my bike and someone's dog got out of control and leaped up and a pit bull mix and just grabbed my thigh. So I sat down, you know, I had to, I was really super injured and you know, the owner of the dog was super good, but she wasn't wearing a mask. So she stayed away from me. And, um, you know, the ambulance came and I, I was so self-centered. I should have been so much more, I wasn't mean or anything, I, I, but I could have been so much more friendly and cordial, but there was so much going on. I mean, it was a really bad looking wound where you're just looking at yourself going, oh my God. Wow. And, um, so I'm going to call her and make an amend, but um, this was so healing. Just the, the idea that I could, for, you know, I did my best and anybody maybe in that situation with a huge piece of their body hanging off and a little puddle of blood and kind of the shock of it would have been in that situation but I just felt I feel badly because I feel like all this mind training <laughs> and it, it where to go you know so it was just a, a blessing to be able to to say you know what you're loved you're forgiven you did your best yeah oh wow Dan I'm so happy that you are um healing and got the help you needed that sounds really um, wow, really, it's the last thing I worry about riding my bike. Yeah, yeah. And then you know what's great, though, is I'm gonna have this big gnarly scar for life that can remind me of that, you know, that, that whatever the situation, even if I was dying, I should have been, you mm. know, reached out the hand of friendship. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I do think, especially for practitioners, this is such, such a slippery slope, right? Because, um, survival mode um, is our, you know, our evolutionarily um, kind of circumscribed response. And when your physical body and psychological well-being are threatened in that moment, sure, we can lose our mindfulness and compassion. And we have the tools to retrospectively go back and repair. Um, I just wouldn't want you to um, take on blame or shame as a result of seeing this clearly, you know, like the seeing it clearly, so beautiful and the desire to connect with this person. Oh, I'm sure it's gonna be met with so much relief. You're gonna do such a great um, compassionate act by reaching out. Um, but the, that, you know, um, feeling as though you were not enough is, is a sticky place. Yeah, then I'm a broken bad person and all this mind training is just, you know, oh. <laughs> it's like a it's like am i just doing this for show <laughs> yeah absolutely not and you know all of this very human material that we are always experiencing this is the richness right and you know i think a lot of the teachings tell us like it's not as though you are what you're seeking is this level of being above 
um, all of these human experiences. It's that we bring awareness and loving presence to them. If that takes five minutes, if that takes five days, if that takes five years, that's okay. You know, it really is. And, um, you know, I, I, I do think it's, it's interesting, actually, Venerable Tenzin, you know, talks about some of the ways that anger is spoken about in traditional texts, like your one moment of anger has shattered all of your years and anger with intent to harm not our anger that we have, right? And, you know, when you are injured, there might be a kind of protective, like, get away, like, get away, like you caused harm. No, That's get me an ambulance. That's where I was coming from. <laughs> right. You know, and, and that is, um, you know, I, I think that there's a difference between that and again, cultivating a habit of blaming or cultivating a habit of aversion. And um, yeah, be, I would just, you know, my humble hope for you would be to be very tender with your self healing. Also, your body knows, you know, and if the body feels as though you're loving yourself inside and out, um, the healing will really be, um, you know, um, supported well, your immune system will know. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Um, Gnome questions. Can we forgive someone on behalf of someone else or only on our own behalf? Very intriguing question. Um, could you possibly give an example? Either by chat or talking it, because I, I think I'm, I'm not quite sure. Who, who might we forgive on behalf of? I was thinking of someone who I blame for harming other people. Ah, and then I was thinking, well, can I forgive them right. on behalf of those people? Yeah, <clears throat> and I think you know, I think it's a beautiful word. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know, it's um, as you know, the Dalai Lama so beautifully described in in that Beyond Religion text that we um, went through last year. Compassion and forgiveness are interchangeable. And so it's, it's not as though you forgive in our sense of like, and now it's okay. <laughs> it's more, can I hold them with love? Um, and so I think we can hold with love people who have harmed others. And it's not as though we're absolving them, but we're releasing ourselves from that, right? When our forgiveness gives us a space of clarity, a space of, um, you know, we can actually see things as, not as they are, but we can see kind of what is ours to do. Um, yeah, I, I honestly think it's, 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 it gives us clarity, it gives us sanity. And I also feel as though forgiveness is, it's like the closest thing to freedom that I can imagine um, in a lot of the situations that are so painful for ourselves and for others. Yeah. I, I think from what you're saying that I'm confusing forgiveness with absolution and you're saying that forgiveness is closer to compassion than, than absolution. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. And uh, Kathy is sharing a book, Sunflower, um, exploring whether we can forgive someone on behalf of others. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's these really interesting um, instances we see of how do we collectively as a society create a process of forgiveness um, or as um, in the apartheid in South Africa, the truth and reconciliation. Um, and that those trials were of course to meter out justice, but those trials were public ways of um, being able to identify what harm had been done. Um, and Forgiveness, I'm not sure. I wasn't, I know, I, I know reconciliation was a goal. Uh, I'm not close enough to that work um, to really say. Any other reflections on that practice? I went for the vice presidential candidate for forgiveness. And it was him as a baby worked for me. 
Um, and I, you know, I hear that instruction and I'm always like, huh, that's a weird instruction. And then you try it and you're like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> There's, you know, certain ways in which we understand this universal human experience and being a baby is, is a conduit there. Um, so kind of interesting to start playing with this again, always, this is a very meaningful verse. All, I mean, slogan, always, this is a very meaningful practice. But I think especially right now, as we're heading into the election, um, how we can really start training our hearts and minds for what we don't know, but can imagine will likely be a really hard time. A really hard time. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I've been talking with a couple other Dharma teachers about what we can offer um, to our communities in the, in the days after that, um, that evening and in the weeks to come, because we, we all don't know, but um, I, I feel fairly confident we're gonna need the Dharma. So yeah, I think it's, it's good for us to really engage with these practices. So let's just take a moment and, and dedicate the merit, meaning sending the benefit, any of our energy and intention that we've gathered here together May this extend as far and as wide as imaginable. May it be of benefit to all beings so that all beings would know forgiveness. All beings would know safety. All beings would experience belonging. All beings would be healthy and at ease. Nice to be with you all. Yeah, take care of yourselves and be well.